All right, coming back to um, Rene Girard, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, a few chapters, um, maybe summarize them a bit. I think we stopped at chapter 10, which was the uniqueness of the Gospels. Prior to that was the uniqueness of the Bible. Both of those in this 11th chapter, the triumph of the cross, uh, juxtapose the stories of the Judeo-Christian tradition against the history of the myths um, that came before before the stories and how there are uh, there's a significant difference that is important and it has to do with um, the short circuiting of the scapegoat mechanism which chapter 12 is entitled scapegoat I'm going to skip that one as well so it was the Christian story which is a singularly unique story that um, short circuited the the uh, single victim mechanism that uh, in through history allowed civilizations to form a semblance of peace after a time of uh, mimetic violence. Uh, no, that is no longer possible, which um, uh, is something that has to be and has continued to be dealt with in, in today's world. I wanted to skip to chapter 13. I just read these last couple chapters and they had a significant, just visceral effect on me. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of a kind of a background. So I'm going to read probably chapter 13, maybe in its entirety. Uh, chapter 14 is the um, chapter that I just read a bit ago. It is entitled uh, The Twofold Nietzschean Heritage. And it I, it, it uh, hit me right in the chest. Um, I feel like the insight that was given in this chapter, um, it made me feel like there was a, a differentiation between a chunk of my past and the present, um, which opened up kind of a space of uh, a clear space to uh, look towards the future, which is really that that impactful on me. Um, so, especially I've read Nietzsche a lot, and um, you know the insight that that was given there was great. So let's go with chapter thirteen. This was a very significant chapter. It talks about the history of uh, every other civilization and how it is in. It is, um, if you would look back to every civilization, you would not see this uh, concern for victims that is so characteristic of our modern world. And he kind of goes into the roots of that. So it's entitled, The Modern Concern for Victims. Above one of the portals of many medieval churches is a great angel holding a pair of scales. The angel is weighing souls for eternity. For eternity. If art in our time had not given up expressing the ideas that guide our world, it would rejuvenate this ancient weighing of souls and citizens would be would have a weighing of victims sculpted over the entrance of our parliaments, universities, courts of law, publishing houses, and television stations. Our society is the most preoccupied with victims of any that ever was. Even if it's insincere, a big show, the phenomenon has no precedent. No historical period, no society we know has ever spoken of victims as we do. We can detect in recent past the beginnings of the contemporary attitude, but every day new records are broken. We are all actors as well as witnesses in the great anthropological first. Examine ancient sources, inquire everywhere, dig up the corners of the planet, and you will not find anything anywhere that even remotely resembles our modern concern for victims. The China of the Mandarins, the Japan of the Samurai, the Hindus, the pre-Columbian societies, Athens, Republican or Imperial Rome, none of these were worried in the least little bit about victims whom they sacrificed without number to their gods, to the honor of the homeland, to the ambition of conquerors, small or great. An extraterrestrial who heard our words without knowing anything about human history would no doubt imagine that there existed somewhere in past centuries a society very superior to ours in terms of compassion. This imagined society must have been so attentive to the sufferings of the unfortunate that it left an undying memory among human beings and that we make it into the fixed star about which our obsession with victims turns. Only our nostalgia for such a society would enable this alien to understand our severity toward ourselves, the bitter reproaches we make to ourselves. Of course, this ideal society has never existed. Already when Voltaire composed his Candide in the 18th century, he searched for one and found none superior to the world in which he was living. He therefore had to make up a purely fictional society. This is an interesting uh, section here. 
The world in which we live, day, uh, we live day by day usually doesn't furnish us with the satisfying material for condemning ourselves, but that doesn't keep us from repeating with a hue and a cry against the contemporary world accusations we know to be false. Never was a society, we often hear, more indifferent to the poor than ours. Yet how could this be, since the idea of social justice, is imperfect, as imperfectly realized as it may be, is found nowhere else? It is quite a recent innovation. If I speak as I do, it is not to exonerate our world of all fault. I share the conviction of my contemporaries about its guilt, but I am trying to discover the place and point of view from which we condemn ourselves. I think we have excellent reasons to feel guilty, but they are certainly not the ones we state. To justify the curses we rain upon ourselves, it is not enough to realize that we are the richest and best equipped of all the societies in history. The rich and powerful were not lacking even in the most miserable societies, and they showed utter indifference to the countless victims about them. Our world must be under an injunction that imposes on itself. The generations just preceding us already heard the same summons, but it wasn't nearly as loud and urgent. The more we go back in time, the weaker the summons sounds. This suggests that in the future it will become even louder. Since we cannot pretend to hear nothing, we condemn our, def our, def our deficiencies, but we don't know why or in, this, in the name of what. We pretend to believe that what summons us is something everyone has always heard, but in reality we are the only ones who hear it. By comparison to the means at our disposal, our good deeds are insignificant, it is true. Our failures are horrible. We have good reason to blame ourselves, but where do they come from? The worlds that preceded us shared our concern, our worry, and our solicitude so little that they weren't sensitive enough to reproach their own indifference. If we question our historians, they will invoke modern humanism and other ideas of the same kind that enable them never to mention religion and to say nothing about the role of Christianity. The latter supposedly null and void can hardly have failed to play a role in the origin of these ideas. In France, humanism developed in opposition, of course, to the Christianity of the pre-revolutionary regime, which was accused of complicity with those in power, and quite rightly so. From one country to another, the sudden turns of fortune are different, but they cannot conceal the true origin of our modern concern for victims. It is quite obviously Christian. Humanism and humanitarianism, humanitarianism develop first on Christian soil. Nietzsche proclaimed vigorously against the hypocrisy of his own time, which was basically the same as our own, but not as gross. Nietzsche, the most anti-Christian philosopher of the 19th century, identified the source of our guilt in the era when it was less evident than today. It was already a caricature of Christianity, but less caricaturally, uh, caricaturally obvious than today. There is a Christian ethic as such, it is essentially love of one's neighbor or charity in the old Christian sense. It is not that hard to locate its origin. There's a quote from Matthew 25. Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visited me. In prison and you came to see me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you to drink, a stranger and welcome you, naked and clothe you, sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you do it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. End quote. The idea of a society alien to violence goes back clearly to the preaching of Jesus, to his announcement of the kingdom of God. This ideal does not diminish to the extent that Christianity recedes. To the contrary, it, it, its intensity increases. The concern for victim has become a paradoxical competition of mimetic rivalries, of opponents continually trying to outbid one another. The victims most interesting to us are always those who allow us to condemn our neighbors. And our neighbors do the same. They always think first about victims from whom they hold us responsible. We do not all have the same experience as St. Peter and St. Paul, who discovered they themselves were guilty of persecution and confessed their own guilt rather than that of their neighbors. It's our neighbors who kindly remind us that we should be compassionate and we render them the same service. In our world, in short, we are all, but, uh, we are all bombarding each other with victims. The final result is what Christ announced. Uh, yeah, sorry. 
the, the final result is what Christ announced in words that the modern concern for victims clarifies for the first time. Quote, The blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. End quote. It's from Luke 11. The teaching has come to be verified with a considerable delay from the schedule and first Christians anticipated, but the important thing is not to date not the date of the verification, but that it was verified. From now on, we have our anti-sacrificial rituals of victimization, and they unfold in an order as unchangeable as properly religious rituals. First of all, we lament the victims we admit to be making, uh, we admit to making or allowing to be made. Then we lament the hypocr- hypocrisy of our lamentation. And finally, we lament Christianity, the indispensable scapegoat, for there is no ritual without a victim, and in our day, Christianity is always it, the scapegoat of last resort. As part of this last stage of the ritual, we affirm in a nobly suffering tone that Christianity has done nothing to resolve the problem of violence. In our perpetual comparisons between our world and the others of the past, we always use two weights and two measures. We do everything possible to conceal the overwhelming superiority of our world, which, in any case, is in competition only with itself as it takes in the entire entire planet. Whether we examine the matter attentively or not, we easily see that everything people say about our world is true. It is by far the worst of all worlds. They say repeatedly, and this is not false, that no world has made more victims than it has. But the opposite proposition is equally true. Our world is also, and by far, the best of all worlds, the one that saves more victims than any other. In order to describe our world, we must multiply all sorts of propositions that should be incompatible, but now are true, sim- uh, now are true simultaneous- sim- simultaneously. The concern for victims leads us to the sound opinion that our progress in humanitarianism is very slow and we should certainly not glorify it in order not to slow it down even more. The modern concern for victims obligates us to blame ourselves perpetually. Our concern for victims is characteristically never satisfied with past successes. It never praises itself or tolerates its own praise. It tries to turn attention away from itself because we should be attentive only to victims. Our concern denounces its own laxity, its Phariseeism. Our concern for victims is the secular mask of Christian love. In short, what prevents us from examining our concern for victims too closely is this concern itself. Whether this humility is feigned or sincere, it is, a, it is compulsory in our world, and there is no doubt that it stems from Christianity. The concern for victims does not operate on the basis of statistics. It operates on the gospel principle of the lost sheep for whom the shepherd will abandon all his flock, if need be. To prove ourselves that we really neither uh, we are really neither ethnocentric nor triumphalist triumphalist, we thunder against the bourgeois self-satisfaction of the last century. We ridicule the foolishness of so-called progress, and we fall into the opposite foolishness. We confess to being the most inhumane of all societies. Yet modern democracies can defend themselves by pointing to a mass of accomplishments so unique in human history that they are the envy of the rest of the world. The gradual loosening of various centers of cultural isolation began in the Middle Ages and has now led into what we call globalization, which in my view is only secondarily an economic phenomenon. The true engine of progress is the slow decomposition of the closed worlds rooted in victim mechanisms. This is the force that destroyed archaic societies and henceforth dismantles the one replacing them, the nations we call quote-unquote modern. Since the fashion is one of weighing victims, let's play the game without cheating. Let's examine first the scale that holds our successes. Since the high Middle Ages, all the great human institutions have evolved in the same direction. More human, more humane private and public law. Penal legislation, judicial practice, the rights of individuals. Everything changed very slowly at first, but the pace has been accelerating more and more. When viewed in terms of the large picture, this social and cultural evolution goes always in the same direction, toward the mitigation of punishment, greater protection for potential victims. Our society abolished slavery as well as serfdom. Later has come the protection of children, women, the aged, foreigners from abroad, and foreigners within. There's also the battle against poverty and underdevelopment. More recently, we have made medical care and protection of the handicapped 
that handicap the universal. Every day we cross new thresholds. When a catastrophe occurs at some spot on the globe, the nations that are well off feel obligated to send aid or to participate in rescue operations. You may say these gestures are, are more symbolic than real and reflect a concern for prestige. No doubt, but in what era before ours and under what skies has international mutual aid constituted a source of prestige for nations? There's just one rubric that gathers together everything I'm summarizing in no particular order and without concern from completeness, the concern for victims. This concern sometimes is so exaggerated and in a, in a fashion so subject to caricature that it arouses laughter, but we should guard against seeing it as only one thing, as nothing but twaddle that's always ineffective. It is more than a hypocritical comedy. Through the ages, it has created a society incompatible, incomparable to all others. It is unifying the world for the first time in history. How have all these things actually come to pass? In each generation, legislators question more radically an ancestral heritage that they felt was their duty to transform. Where their ancestors saw nothing to be reformed, they discovered oppression and injustice. The status quo had long appeared untouchable, determined by nature or intended by the gods, even by the Christian God. For centuries, successive waves of concern for victims have revealed and restored new types of scapegoats at the lowest levels of society. Only a few spiritual geniuses in the past suspected that the unjust sufferings of these scapegoats could be eliminated. The modern concern for victims comes to the forefront for the first time, I think, in the religious institutions we call charitable. This begins, it seems, with the house of God, that extended arm of the church that quickly became the hospital. The hospital welcomes all the crippled and ill without distinction of social, political, or even religious identity. Inventing the hospital meant disassociating for the very first time the idea of victim from all concrete ethnic, regional, or class identity. It is the invention of the modern victim concept. The cultures that were still autonomous cultivated all sorts of solidarity, solidarity, familial, tribal, and national. But they did not recognize the victim as such, the anonymous and unknown victim, in the sense in which we say, quote-unquote, the unknown soldier. Prior to the discovery, there was no humanity in the full sense except with, within a fixed territory. Today, all these local, regional, and national identities are disappearing. Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma means behold the man. This is the Roman governor Pontius Pilate's exclamation about Jesus as he appears before a crowd that shouts for his crucifixion. It's a footnote. The essential thing in what goes now, what goes now as human rights is an indirect acknowledgement of the fact that every individual or every group of individuals can become the quote-unquote scapegoat of their own community. Placing emphasis on human rights amounts to a formerly unthinkable effort to control uncontrollable processes of, mem of memetic snowballing. I'm going to read that again. Placing emphasis on human rights amounts to a formerly unthinkable effort to control uncontrollable processes of mimetic snowballing. What we have a foreboding of, at least vaguely, is the possibility that any community, whatever, may persecute its own members. This happens whenever crowds mobilize suddenly against anyone, anywhere, anytime, in any way, no matter what the pretext. It also happens more frequently when societies become pre uh, preeminently or organized on a basis of that privileges the few at the expense of the many. When unjust forms of social life continue for centuries, even for millennia. The concern for victims seeks to protect us against the countless varieties of the victim mechanism. The most effective power of transformation is not revolutionary violence, but the modern concern for victims. What pervades this concern and makes it effective is a true knowledge of oppression and persecution. It seems that this knowledge was at first very limited, and then it became bolder by virtue of its early successes. To summarize this knowledge, we must return to the analysis of the preceding chapter. It is the knowledge that separates the ritual meaning of the expression scapegoat from its modern meaning. It deepens continually, and soon the mimetic reading of the structure of persecution will become more and more widespread. The evolution, the evolution I am rather haphazardly summarizing forms the basis of the effort of our societies to eliminate the permanent scapegoat structures that form their foundation, and this occurs to the extent that we become aware of their existence. This transformation comes across as a timeless moral imperative.
Societies that did not see the need for transforming themselves are nonetheless all altered, always in the same direction, in response to the desire to make amends for past injustices and to bring about more quote-unquote humane relations among their members. Each time a new frontier is crossed, those whose interests are damaged oppose this change intensely. But once the situation has been altered, the results are never seriously contested. In the 18th and 19th centuries, some people realized that this evolution was on the way to creating a group of of nations whose uniqueness in terms of progress was further enhanced by their rapidly accelerating technological and economic progress. It was mostly the privileged classes, of course, that benefited from this um, from this technological and economic progress, and they fell into an over, overweening pride and extraordinary insolence. It is possible to view the great catastrophes of the 20th century as in part the inevitable punishment of this pride and insolence. We can compare ancient societies to one another, but the global society now in the making is truly unique. Its superiority in every area is so overwhelming, so evident that it is forbidden, paradoxically, to acknowledge the fact, especially in Europe. This prohibition stems from the fear of a return to tyrannical pride. It is also the fear of humiliating nations that don't belong to the privileged group. In other words, it is once again the concern for victims that dominates what is permissible and impermissible to say. Our society perpetually confesses to crimes and faults of which it is certainly guilty when considered against our absolute standard, but it is innocent relative to all the other types of societies. We certainly have not ceased being ethnocentric, But it is evident also that we are the least ethnocentric of all societies in history. We are the ones who invented the concept of five five or six centuries ago. Montagain's chapter on the cannibals is proof of that. To be capable of such an invention, it is necessary, no doubt, to be less ethnocentric than other societies, which are so exclusively preoccupied with themselves that they never forge the notion of ethnocentrism, even if our self-criticism is superficial. We are the only society that ever invented the unique, this unique intellectual activity. Our world did not invent compassion, it is true, but it has universalized it. In archaic cultures, it was practiced within extremely circumscribed groups. Their borders were always marked by victims. Mammals marked their territorial borders with their excrement. Human beings have long done the same thing with that particular form of excrement that we call their scapegoats. Thanks for listening.